Brother Brown. Thank you. Good evening, friends. It's a privilege to be here tonight again in, in Tipton. This is kind of a grand surprise to me. I had told our good friend, Brother Welch Evans, some time ago when I was getting a little tired, I said, I'm coming down through Tifton to go fishing. And I said, when I come, I'll meet with you over there somewhere and we'll have, a, I thought, a cottage prayer meeting. And here I find myself over here in a school auditorium tonight. And a little bit hoarse from when we're over speaking, I had a short sermon yesterday, only six hours long, as long as I preached. So, uh, uh, now, I'm not scaring you. I won't be that long tonight. <laughs> I'm positive of that. But um, being a little hoarse and and coming by, but it's a privilege to be here and to get to meet this fine pastor that just gives such a fine royal introduction. And we're happy to always meet the people. <clears throat> and the expression the brother has just made is absolutely the truth. We can say amen to it because the devil in these last days are like a roaring lion going around devouring whatever he can find to devour for he knows his time is short he hasn't got very much longer to do it so he must do it while he's got time to do it i like the situation of this little auditorium very thankful to the school board the principal and those who has been so nice to let us have it for you fine people who are here in cooperation for this little momentarily set up meeting and ever who laid the little mal a welcome mat out here in the street, I noticed, well, that was very fine. I think uh, Brother Willie over here was the one did that. I appreciate it. I like maybe if the Lord being willing sometime where we could come by for a season of services, get with this fine pastor and others here and get a meeting set up for four or five nights where we could sufficiently advertise it, get all the churches in together because, you know, we need one another right now. More than we ever did in all the history of the world is right now. Real royal believers, we need each other. And so I'm, it's a, always a blessing wherever you go and meet God's people. It's a blessing everywhere. I see we've got some youngsters out here watching a little boy and girl sitting here a few moments ago in the front seat. The cutest little fellas, little bitty things sitting up there just as nice. I like that. Children. There's something about children that's innocent, sweet. I, I like that. And now, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Now, I thought that it would be nice tonight if we just took our time and sowed some seed that of uh, the word of the Lord. And yesterday, I preached this six hours upon a subject, the original seed of the word. And we brought it from Genesis to Revelations back and forth on a six hour tape that what God's program was, what he is, and how that the spoken word of God is the seed of God. And the Bible said that over in Luke, that the word of God is a seed that the sower sowed. And now we know that any word sowed has to be watered before it'll bring forth its crop. But if the water falls on the ground, no matter what kind of seed is in that ground, it'll bring forth of its kind. Because God said in Genesis 1.11, let every seed bring forth of its kind. That each thing, and when the water falls, Hebrews 6 chapter, we find out that um, the rains come off upon the earth to water it, to dress it, to bring forth the fruit. But the weeds and briars and and things that's in the earth comes forth by the same water. But by their fruits, you're no one. So Christians are known by the fruits of the Holy Spirit. That's what dominates a Christian's life, proves what he is. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, faith, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, make, patience, and the Holy Spirit. Those fruits manifest themselves through Christians. Now... We found yesterday 
that in there, that the seed that was sowed, the discard seed, that was Satan sowed the discard. When he told Eve a lie, and we find out to disbelieve one word of God spoken caused every death that ever was, every sickness and all this trouble. Just believing, misbelieving one word. She didn't exactly believe it. She tried to mix something with it. And nothing will mix with the Word of God. It's got to be that because it's the original seed. God is eternal. And God is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh among us. Now, God... And his word is a self-same being. Think of it. I believe that God will judge the world someday. Not by the act of Congress, not by the act of a church, but by his word he'll judge the world. If we had to take church, organization church, which one of them is right? They differ so much one from another. The Catholic difference from the Protestant, the Protestant difference from the Orthodox, the all, well, we differ in every one. So which one of them would be right? We would have a confusion in our mind constantly. A person wouldn't know what to do. And a just God, the judge of all the earth, will surely give us something to be judged by. And I read in the Bible that heavens and earth will pass away, but God's word shall not pass away. I read in the Bible that whosoever shall take anything out of it or add anything to it, his part will be taken out of the book of life. That it stands just the way it is. Many try to say it's been tampered with. It's been done this way or that way. I do not believe that. I believe there's got to be some kind of a standard that God will judge the, the church by or the world. There's got to be some standard. It cannot be in church organization because they differed who would know what to do but there is a standard and that's his word I believe that God watches over his word I believe that that word is punctuated exactly the way God wants it the Bible it's God's word to the, the people there's where reason I believe in that word and I believe the word is a seed and if that seed is sowed in the right ground and watered by the Holy Spirit It'll bring forth of its kind. Any promise that God made, God will do it. When we see God heal a man, here a few days ago in our church, I'd give out as go to preach there on a Sunday. Last Sunday week it is now, a week from last Sunday. They brought a little girl in there on a stretcher. And they called me in the nighttime on the road and said the girl cannot live. The cancer was so bad, about 17 years old, she can't even get there. She's going to die. Before she gets there. It's a pitiful case. A lovely little child of 17 years old. To prove something in my church. I never touched the child at all. I never as much as touched her. I walked in laying on a stretcher. Of course with other sick people. But I was concerned about the child. To catch her spirit when I spoke to her. And she seemed like a very fine little girl. I see no reason why that child should fill a premature grave. And that has to be the devil trying to take her life. So I never touched the child at all. Went right to the pulpit with the word and stayed right with the word. And the word healed her so instantly until she got up and walked away. It's all right now. Living like anybody else. Can't find a trace of it anywhere. Never even touched the word. Or touched her. See, the word went forth and she believed the word. And the word is God's life and God's power. And the word is what does it. The Word heals the sick. Then you say, well, Jesus healed the sick. He is the Word. He is the Word. When you receive the Word, you receive Jesus. For He is the Word. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We believe that, don't we? Ever bit. We believe that Christ is God's Word made manifest. And we believe that His bride must be the same thing. We believe that she must believe every bit of the Word and have that Word in her because she is part of the body. She is the body where he is the head. And when he died and rose from the dead and resurrected and sat on high on the, by the majesty of God on his throne, right hand of majesty, 
then and we are his delegates, and we reckon ourselves dead and buried by baptism, raised with him, and now seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That gives us all shouting, wouldn't it? Think of that. We are not will be, we are now. Now we are sons of God. Now we are daughters of God. Not we will be seated. Now we are seated. Okay. Though so Jesus said the scriptures has to be fulfilled. Every word has to come to pass. Today we've gotten so far away from it. We just mixed ourselves up with creeds and so forth until we're just gone out on a, a wild tantrum just as the Bible said we would do. Exactly. Adam, before he got to his wife, she was pregnated with evil seed. She took the devil's lie and tried to mix it with God's word. And it caused death. The first child was born from her had death. Every child since has had death. Jehovah's wife, when he brought her up out of Egypt and sanctified her and started her on the road, what did she do? She done the same thing. Jehovah taking his wife over to the promised land on the road up there. She heard a false prophet by the name of Balaam. And what did she do? Why, there's no difference in us. Let's all unite together and be one family. That's what the bride has done with the world. United with the world with her creeds and things and denied the word of God saying days of miracles is past. There's no such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And where's she at now? Divorced. Just Jesus' bride had done the same thing that Jehovah's bride did and the same thing that uh, Adam's bride did. Yes, just exactly. The Bible said the mouth of three witnesses that every word be established. There's three churches, three brides. All of them done the same thing. But in the face of all that, there is a real bride that God's bringing forth and has a little bit out of each each time there's been a reformation, there's been so much of the word spread forth, and each generation gets its time. Did you ever notice? There'll be a man of God come along that'll strike fire with God, and there'll be a great revival sweep the land. And what happens? Immediately after that, they take that man's idea and denominate it and bring in creeds and mix with it. There she dies and never rises again. That's right. Always has been. Always will be. Every time. But each generation, what does it get? It's opportunity at the fresh word of God. Each time, like Luther under justification, like Wesley under sanctification, the Pentecostal move under the baptism of the Holy Spirit. See, each one gets its chance. Then what does a man do that follows those great reformers? Denominate it, organize it, mix in creeds with it. A little bit here and a little bit there. A new bunch of school scholars comes along with a bunch of psychology, just the same as Eve was trying to find some new light, mix it up with the Word of God, death, way went the organization and died spiritually. It's exactly right. It's the way it's always been. Now, believe it or not, you might not think so, but I'm going to speak tonight, if the Lord willing, upon a subject of the end time seed sign. What kind of a sign will the seed sign be at the end time? Before we read the word, let's bow our heads and speak to the author of it. I wonder tonight with our heads bowed, realizing that we're living in the shadows of the coming of the Son of God. I wonder if there be requests tonight. Would like to let God know that you're sincere and you have something on your heart that you'd want God to do for you. Just raise your hands to him. Say, this is me, God. I want this and this. Thank you. Our Heavenly Father, we are approaching thy throne of grace, never thy throne of judgment. God, we don't desire the judgment because we could not stand at that throne. But we're so glad that there was one stood there for us, thy son, the Lord Jesus. He stood there for us and stood the judgments that we might have the right to the throne of grace. And we are approaching tonight in his name. And he said himself, and every word that come from him was a scripture, and they must be fulfilled. 
He said, if you ask my father anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, we know that that word is true. And we're approaching in Jesus' name to ask our Heavenly Father to grant unto us pardoning grace from His loving throne of grace. We're asking Him tonight for Him to make His word plain and known to us and reveal to us the hour that we are approaching. For we do not want to stumble as one not knowing where we are going. The man who knows not where he goes stumbles. And you said we were children of the light and we should know where we are going. Step by step as pack and alike. It shows not all the way down, but as we take the steps. I pray, Father, as we take this step tonight towards this meeting, that we will see what the purpose of God is for us being here. And I pray to Thee, O Lord, that every hand that went up at this meeting tonight will be the purpose of that request behind the hand be answered. If it's for salvation, God grant tonight that they will receive it. If it's domestic trouble, straighten up the home, Lord. Give peace. If it's for someone who is distressed, Give thy mercy, Father. If it's for someone sick, let the healing words of God be sank down deep in their heart tonight that will bring forth a crop of good divine and health tomorrow. Grant it, Lord. Hear us. We present the word to you tonight with ourselves and these texts that you might bring from it a context and reveal to us the things that we should know. Bless this people. Bless this school. In this day that when someone would say they're going to hold a meeting, an uh, interdenominational group, they coldly would have turned it down. But this principle opened the door. We pray, God, that you'll bless him and let him know that it's written in the Scripture, in so much as you have done unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. When were you needy and we did not minister? And you said, I will say, as you did to these, you have done to me. I pray, Heavenly Father, that from this school will go forth mighty anointed preachers for the day ahead. I pray for every person that's here, their pastors. Bless their churches, Lord. May that a great revival break out in the community here, among the peoples, and cause many to be saved. Heal the sick and afflicted. Get glory unto thyself. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> a very odd little scripture reading. When you go home, I'd like for you to read the chapter. Amos, the third chapter and the seventh verse. Odd, strange setting for the text. But, you know, God does things kind of strange and odd. Works in peculiar ways, mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. Now, that text that I would like to use is this, the end time sign seed. And as I've just told you yesterday, preaching so much on the seed, for it's the word. All things begin in Genesis, because Genesis means beginning our seed chapter of the Bible. Everything we have on earth today, the origination of it started in Genesis. Now, we have things today that did not begin in Genesis because it's been hybrid. Anything hybrid is a phony. It's no good. It cannot reproduce itself. Anything that's hybrid is man-made and cannot bring itself back again. I've said many times, we take the breeding of stock. 
Like you take the, the donkey and the mare, and they bring forth the mule, but the mule cannot breed himself back. He don't know what's father or mother. He's mixed up. We take corn today. It's hybrid. They say it's more beautiful, bigger ear, but it's no good. You see what Reader's Digest just wrote of it? If women continue to eat chicken and beef and stuff that's hybrid in 20 years from now, the human race will cease to exist. Women can no more have babies. That's right. High breeding no good. Take corn, high breed it, make a great big ear. What does it do? All right, if you want to eat it on the big ear. But what happens to it? Plant it back, it can't reproduce itself again. It's no good. It's dead. Therefore, anything that wasn't spoke by God in the beginning is a hybrid. That's the way that people get away from the Word of God. It becomes a hybrid affair. It must die. It cannot bring forth of its kind to life again. The church that will refuse to, to believe the Word of God is a hybrid church with dogmas, creeds, doctrines that's not scriptural. That church cannot bring forth a spirit-filled child because it's hybrid. It's no good. It might be bigger, great big walls, fine pews, big uh, bells, plush seats, but that doesn't mean one thing. It's spiritually dead. That's right. It cannot bring forth spirit-filled children because it's dead itself. Now, Speaking six hours on that subject, and tonight, going back again to this same end time seed sign. Now, all wise people, if he's all right in his head, he's always trying to find what's ahead of him. All of us wants to know that. What's the next move shall I make? Where do I go from here? It's like a man crossing a stream. He steps on one rock. Then he looks around to see where his next step shall be. For he doesn't, he can't just jump anywhere. If he does, he'll drown himself. He must watch where he's going. After I cross this, then where? All of us are that way. That's been the cry of the human race down through the ages. Where from here? The king of England, one night when a saint baptized him the next morning, they were sitting by a fire, a great big, uh, like a piazza, and there's a great furnace of fire, or great we would call it, only a large mammoth big place where logs was laying. The saint was trying to tell the king about God. And a little sparrow finished his sermon. The little sparrow in the nighttime flew into the dark, into the light, went back out of the light, into the dark. And the saint raised up and said to the king, where did he come from and where did he go? That's what we want to know. Where did we come from and what are we doing here and where do we go from here? Now, the, all the science that we got, as many bones as we've dug up, as many books as we've wrote, there's not one book that can tell you where you come from, what you are, and where you're going. Only one book, and that's the Bible. It tells you where you come from, what you are here, and where you are going. So therefore, if we want to know where from here, let's take the only book that can tell us. Ancient bones are digging up and, and stag lights and so forth can prove nothing. God's Word's got the answer. It's got the answer to everything that we ask. It's in God's book. Man has often wondered. We go down sometimes and read the Scriptures and wonder over them, but... We're not supposed to wonder. You can't explain them. You've got to believe them. No man can, can scientifically prove God. If you can prove God scientifically, then it's no more a faith. We're supposed to believe God. And faith is not scientific. What if Moses would have pulled some of the leaves off the trees and said, I believe I'll take it to the laboratory to find out what chemical is on them. It won't let them burn. See, God would have never talked to him. He did not 
No, that the only thing he done was take off his shoes and sit down in reverence and God talk back to him. We cannot scientifically prove these promises of God, but we look back and find out where in season every one of them happened just as God said they would. So in reverence and respects to his word tonight, let's just sit down for a while and look at it and see where we're going. What's the purpose? What are we here for? What's it all about? There's some time ago I was out west and I was standing in a man's house that invited me out for, for dinner. And he said, Mr. Branham, uh, I see you admiring that sculpture, painting, or not painting, but uh, it was kind of carved out of wood, plaque, like over the fireplace. I said, yes, sir, I am. And it was an old ox cart or covered wagon with oxes, a man in front, a little boy sitting on the seat with his mother, and they were traveling. And he said... That was my father and mother, and the little boy on the seat was myself. He said, we come here in this ox cart. He said, but since then we have so prospered. He said, I want you to step out here in the yard. He said, I forget how many thousands of acres that he owned there of a ranch. He said, I bought that in my young days. And he said... Then after that, the joining ranch to the west, I own. The joining ranch to the south, I own. Said, you see the smoke over there? Yes, sir. Said, that's a city. I forget how much property he owned there. He said, I'm the president in that bank there. Telling me what all he had. I listened for a little while. And I said, I would like to ask you one question, sir. You have pointed to the east and to the west, showing the ranches and to the city. I would like to have you look up this way and see and tell me how much you own up there. That's the main thing because someday you're going to leave every bit of this down here. And then where do you go from there? That's the main thing. This is a short stay here, but that's an eternal stay there. So I think we ought to consider where we are going for eternity, if we can so supply and fix our families and so forth here on earth with homes, houses, and comfort, that education, that's the things we should do. But the, one of the main things we should do, we leave undone till we get to the end of the road and drown ourselves in an eternity knowing nothing about God, about His plan of salvation and redeeming grace of Jesus Christ. It's pitiful that we do it, but we do. The wise people, when they find out that they're a creature of time, they wonder what it is after time ceases. Now, I'm going to speak of a man by the name of Job for a few moments. That's the oldest book in the Bible. We understand that Job was one of the wisest men in the world of his days. Why, he said, when he'd go to the markets, the young princes would bow before him for wisdom. He was a great man. But that man began to realize of all of his greatness, he wondered what after this is all over. Then what's it going to be? He wondered what would take place. So he speaks then and begins to watch about God's creation. He knew that all things was created by a word from God. And we, he noticed also, uh, he said, there's hope if a tree dies, it'll live again. If you notice nature, God in his great way to express his feelings to the people that they'll be sure, whether they got a Bible or anything else, he expresses himself in nature to you. Watch the sun when it comes up of a morning. What happens to the sun? It's a little baby born in the east. And about 10 o'clock, it's in its teenage. At noontime, it's in its strength. In the afternoon, it's in its middle age. And at evening, it's gone. It sets. It's finished. Is that all the sun? No. God's got a purpose for the sun, so the sun comes back and rises again the next morning. What does it speak of? Birth, life, death, resurrection. Look at your flowers. I was noticing today coming down the flowers. 
How pretty they are. They're here for a purpose. They're spoken words of God. God spoke them into existence. And when he did, look what happens. They're pretty standing in your yard. After a while, frost hits them. Young ones, old ones, middle age. As soon as frost hits them, it's dead. They bow their little head. And what happens? A little black seed of some sort drops out of them. Believe it or not, God has a funeral procession for them. The fall rains come and tears, as it was, drops from the skies and buries the seed. The winter comes on. The petals gone. The stalks gone. The bulbs gone. The seed freezes, burst open. The pulp runs out. Is that the end of the seed? No, sir. Let that warm sunshine which brings forth the resurrection of all botany life. As soon as that sun begins to light the earth and get warm, there's a germ of life somewhere in that seed, and it lives again. Why? It served a purpose of God, and God makes a way for it to live again. Now, we were put here for a purpose, but we must serve that purpose Choose either death or life. So we're put here for a purpose, but we must serve that purpose. That's serving God, because we're sons and daughters of God. Now, Job watched the creation. He saw that after death, it wasn't the end of it. He saw that after death, there was life again. Life, as soon as the sun got right, it was life again. Well, he said, if that seed is a spoken seed or a spoken word of God, and it serves its purpose and dies. But he said, a man, I'm looking at some scripture here from Job now, Job 14. But a man layeth down, he giveth up the ghost, he wastes away. His sons come to mourn, he perceiveth not. Where is he? Oh, that thou would hide me in the grave and keep me in the secret place till thy wrath be passed. Job said, I see a flower die, it serves its purpose, and it rises up. I see a tree die, fall the year, puts forth its leaves. Did you ever notice a tree? It'll put forth its leaf. And then it serves its time through the summer. Autumn comes way before the frost falls. That leaf begins to turn yellow, red, brown. After a while, it drops off the tree, falls down. Is that the end of it? No. What happens? The life that was in that leaf goes back to the root of the tree where it comes from. What does it do then? Spring of the year, it brings forth with it in a resurrection a new leaf. Same life. Returning back with a new leaf. And Christians are hanging on the tree of life. And when the life leaves this old sinful body, it goes back to the God that gives it to come forth again with a new one. Because it's serving a purpose. Here some time ago, I was down in the state of Kentucky. Or I suppose from here directionally, now that's point north, up in the state of Kentucky. I was hunting. Me and Mr. Woods, one of the trustees here with us tonight. I had a meeting over at a little city called Acton at the Methodist campground. In there, I've been one night we were speaking and the Lord was doing great things and we was having a healing service, praying for the sick. You all were here at the other meeting, you know what ha- takes place. And I cannot heal no other man. God's already done it. You just have to believe it. So he has a way and he promised in the last days a gift that would discern uh, the spirits and so forth. That works. We know that 100%. Because it's God's Word. Make it manifest His promise for this last day. And in there, there was a woman. I'd never been in the country before. And there was a woman sitting back in the audience. And the Holy Spirit got among the people and began to call this one, that one, telling them it was our Lord Jesus. His Word made manifest in the body of His church. And then, when He began to speak, Jesus stood on the ground, knowing the thoughts of their hearts, spoke to them, told the people about different things, as you all Bible readers know. Promised the same thing again to repeat in the last days. Promised it by Scripture. 
that it would do so. Now, I want you to notice. Now, when that was taking place, way back in the back, a lady was weeping somewhere on the big campground. Many, many hundreds and hundreds of people were seated. And there was a lady crying. Notice the Holy Spirit went to the lady and said, you're crying about your sister. Her name is such and such. She lives at a certain place. You have a handkerchief in your pocketbook that you put in there before leaving home. It's this and this way, a handkerchief. You take this handkerchief and go lay it on your sister. She's dying with cancer. And thus saith the Lord, she shall live. The woman took from the building, went and laid her handkerchief on the lady that night. And the next morning she was well. Now, so I was, the season was very hot. Squirrel hunting, as many of my fellow squirrel hunters know, they, the cracking of the leaves scares the squirrels. And we, it was so dry, we had to go to a place where there were some hollers that we could get into, little ditches to walk through the woods. My friend's name was Mr. Woods. He's sitting over here to my right. And he said, I know a man that's got a ground of many acres, but said he's so hard to deal with, said he's an infidel, and said he don't believe in God. And he said he makes fun of it. And he said, uh, but he knows me, he knows my father. And he said, if I go ask him if we could hunt on his place. I said, let's go. We drove way back in the country, way back on the side road. And two old men were sitting under a shade of an apple tree. He said, there he is, the one to the right. I said, being a minister, I better sit in the car. So he goes out. He said, how do you do? And the man said, come up, sit down. He said, my name is Woods. He said, I wonder if you would care if we hunted a while on your place. He said, what Woods are you? He said, I'm Jim Woods' son. He said, Jim Woods is a friend of mine, and any one of his children can hunt anywhere they want to. He said, thank you. He said, I wonder now. I said, which one are you? He said, I'm Banks. He talked to him a few moments, and Mr. Woods said, I wonder if it'd be all right for me to take my pastor with us. He said, you don't mean you got so low down Do you have to carry a preacher with you wherever you go? He said, my pastor's out there. I thought I'd better get out of the car. And I got out of the car and walked over there. And I said, how do you do? He said, how do you do? So you're a preacher. I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, well, he said, I'm supposed to be an infidel. I said, well, not much to brag about, is it? <laughs> he said, I guess it isn't. He said, but I, what I've got against you people, you're talking about something you don't know about. Oh, I said, is that so? He said, yes, sir. I hear him always blowing off about this, about God and everything. He said, there is no such a thing. I said, mm-hmm. I said, well, of course, you know how it is, sir. I said, everyone to his own thought. I uh, was thinking in my heart, now, Lord, you give me something to help that man. No doubt sincere. And he said, I only seen one preacher in all my life. I, I'd like to hear him. Heard of him. And I said, who was that, sir? He said, you're about two years ago. There's a preacher over here at a town called Acton. He said, an old lady so-and-so up here on the hill have been laying there for two years with cancer. He said, me and my wife, they couldn't put her on the bedpan no more. They had to use a draw sheet. And said, we was up there that morning. He said, the doctor had said the day before that she wouldn't make it through the night. She had cancer in her stomach. She's eat up. She couldn't even drink barley water. And hadn't for weeks. They'd fed her glucose through her veins until her veins was collapsed. And said, there was nothing to be done for. And said... Her sister was sitting over listening to that preacher preach, and that preacher didn't know anybody. You had never been here, and told her who she was and what her sister was, and thought about a handkerchief she had, and said, "Put it on that woman." And said that night, I thought they had the Salvation Army up there somewhere of all the screaming, and said the next morning we went over to see if she is dead, and said when we got over there, she is up cooking fried apple pies and eating them, and said she even does the neighbor's work. He said, now, I said, well, what's so strange about that? He said, well, here's what I want to know. If I ever see that preacher, I'm going to ask him, what was it told him about that woman and where she'd be healed? Oh, I said, yes, sir. Squirrel blood all over me, dirty whiskers about that long, you know. And I said, um, don't look very much like a preacher now. He said, but it looks more human. And I said, yes, sir. So I said, can I have one of those apples? Little yellow jackets is all over him. And he said, yes. I picked up one, and I bit it, and he said, help yourself. The yellow jackets are eating them up. And I said, thank you. And I took a bite of it. I said, that's a fine apple. He said, yep. He said, that old tree's produced a lot of them for me. And I said, yes, sir. 
I said, how old is the tree? He said, about 40 years old. He said, I planted there just a switch. And I said, uh-huh. I said, I noticed all the apples are dropping off of it and the leaves are leaving. He said, yep, that's the way she does. And I said, I want to ask you a question. He said, yes, sir, go ahead and ask. He said, um, I said, what causes, now we haven't had no frost. I said, it's only the middle of August. We won't have no frost till about October or November. I said, but you're in the middle of August. Them leaves are falling off the tree. I said, what's making them leaves fall? Well, he said, the sap's leaving it. And I said, well, if the sap doesn't leave it, he said, why well, would the tree get killed in the wintertime? The germ of life's in the sap. He said, if it would, it would kill the tree, it would die. I said, yes, sir. I said, therefore, the sap goes back down into the roots where it's warm, and stays there through the winter, then it comes back in the summer bringing more leaves and more apples. I said, that's it. I said, I want to ask you something. I said, what intelligence, now the tree has none, what intelligence says to that tree, it's coming wintertime, get down into the root and stay there until spring of the year. I said, put water in a bucket and set it on the post and see if it'll go down when fall of the year comes. It won't do it. I said, you have to admit there's some kind of an intelligence that makes that sap leave the tree and go down into the roots. If it doesn't die, it hides it away to protect its life. Now, the tree has no intelligence. There's a law of God that does that. And he said, well, I never thought of it just like that. I said, mister, the same intelligence that tells that tree up there, the sap in that tree to go to the roots, that same intelligence is what told me who that woman was and tell her what was going to happen. He said, you're not that preacher. I said, yes, sir. And there he was led to Christ and died a Christian a year later, about 85 years old. See, God's all around us. God's everywhere. And if we'll look at nature, we will find him there. Now, after Job had found him in the death, burial, and resurrection of nature, reproduced itself again of its kind, then he couldn't understand about what a man happened. If a man, he says, lays down, he giveth up the ghost, where is he? I see the tree never sinned. Nature never sinned. Man sinned. So he couldn't find than being a prophet. Now the Bible, my text said, he makes his secrets known to his prophets. The word of the Lord comes to the prophet. And being a prophet, we know the story of Job. God finally explained it to Job that the seed of man was imperfect because the mother of man had failed to obey God's word. She tried to mix it with something else, and God's Word won't hybrid to nothing. That's right. Jesus said when he was here, if you have faith like a mustard seed, I would say to this mountain, why do you refer to mustard seed? Mustard seed won't hybrid. It's genuine mustard seed. It will not take breeding with nothing. And he said, otherwise, if you have that much faith, God's Word, that won't hybrid to unbelief or question it. Oh, I feel religious. That you won't question it. No matter what circumstances and anything else, you don't question God's Word. You believe it. You're supposed to believe it. If he would have only believed it, she would have received and She'd have brought forth children right. But before she, her husband got to her, she found her already defiled, like Jehovah did, like Jesus had. There was a defilement in the womb of her thinking. She had accepted a seed of unbelief against God's Word because it produced something to her more brighter and she wanted more knowledge. That's what's the matter today. I'm standing in a school. We'd be a bunch of ignorance if it wasn't for education. And education is a part of our civilization. 
But civilization, education only come by Christianity. Civilization is the grassroots of, of uh, Christianity is the grassroots of civilization. Absolutely. Civilization come by Christ. Certainly. Now, to disbelieve God's Word or mix it with something to have more light, you can't mix it. It won't mix. You've got to believe it just the way God wrote it and the way He spoke it. It's not to be added to or taken away from or anything. You but believe it that way. Now, and when Job, being a prophet, finally the vision broke through. And then when he seen how that God was going to make a way for a man to live again. Because there would be another spoken word that a virgin would receive. That was Eve. First that doubted it. When the word come to Mary, she never doubted it. She said, Behold, the hands made of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. See, she never, she never said, Now you wait till I feel life and then I'll go testify. You wait till I'm positive of it. That's the way we Christians so called today do. Wait till I'm positive. Wait till I begin to get better. Wait, uh, I see something happen and then I'll do it. No, sir. That's not the, qu- that's not the question. You believe it first. What did Elijah tell the, the woman that he went to with nothing but a handful of meal? He said, make me a cake first. Then go start the miracle that happened after you take God's word first. You begin to believe God's word and then the miracle takes place on the word because the word is the seed that brings forth the miracle. You've got to take the word first. The Holy Spirit gives it life like water falling from heaven. We know that the Holy Spirit represents, uh, the water represents the Holy Spirit. Like as Moses lifted up the bright serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up while a perishing people. And when he lifted up the bright serpent, it saved the life of the perishing people when he smote the rock. Christ is that rock that was smitten and out of him come the waters of life. For a perishing people, you must believe it, act upon it. Now, remember now, then when Job seen this coming just one, the one that could stand in the breach between the sinner and God and bridge the way, that perfect seed, these seeds, he says, corrupt. I see him going to the ground. His sons come the morning over him. He perceive it not. He lays there. He never raises. He just lays there. Rots away and that's all of it. He never does raise up again because he's an imperfect seed. But he said, when he found out that there was coming one who would bring back perfection to the word of God again, that would make a way, would bridge the way. Then the prophet got in the spirit and cried out, I know my Redeemer liveth. And in the last days he'll stand upon the earth. Go after the skin worms has destroyed this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. He's seen that perfect one coming. What happened? Job being a prophet, the secrets of God is knowing to the prophet, he spoke the word. And when he spoke the word that God showed him, it become material, for it was a spoken word. And in its season, it happened just exactly that way. Christ was born, the Redeemer one could stand between the living and the dead and bridge the way and brought the resurrection. Exactly why? It was the word of God. Now, he spoke the word and the word was a seed, and it matured in its season. Every seed of God correctly placed will mature. Now, what if God but sent his message by an angel to Mary and said, Hail Mary, blessed art thou amongst women. You're going to have a baby knowing no man. She said, now wait a minute, you Let me take you down to the laboratory and you tell me. Let, let the doctor prove to me just how I'm going to do this. See? Then I'll believe you. It would have never happened. But what did she come to? The womb of her heart. The womb that her spirit was in. Your womb of your spirit is your mind. You, your mind is a channel. You've got five senses that controls the body. You've got five senses that controls the soul. Conscience and so forth. Now, your body, your see, taste, feel, smell in here. But there's only one channel to the inside of that soul. Show that you are a seed, your soul, body, and spirit. 
And then the one channel avenue, one way into that, your own free moral agency, that is you can receive or reject. You do whatever you want to. Therefore, Eve was on the same basis. She could take God's word and said, God said not to do it and get away from here. That would have been all right. But instead of that, she tried to hybrid it with Satan's lie and brought death to her. But when he come to Mary, was different. Behold the hands made of the Lord. How is it going to be? That doesn't matter how it's going to be. You have spoken. It's a word of God. I receive it. Behold the hands made of the Lord. Be it unto me even to thy word. There it was. That settled it. And she, she was all right then. See, she brought forth that germ of life, which was the word of God made manifest in a form of a man. And through the death of that just one, paid the death for ever, the debt of every one of us that's unjust. And by accepting then his word brings life and brings Christ back in us because Christ is the word. The spoken word. And it will mature if you can receive it. You that's sick, accept it. Believe it. It's got to mature. It'll come forth in its season. It's got to. Now, all of us believe that we're in the end time. Any man that's, that's intelligent, I believe, if he would look around and see, it shows this thing can't go on much longer. Now, I want about 15 minutes now to show you what I mean. Anyone knows that something's got to happen. All scriptures point to it. We are taught that the world was created in 6,000 years. Being a thousand a day, one day's a year with God and so forth. 6,000 years in the creation. All right? Six days it's called. And the Bible says one day is a thousand years, or a thousand years is one day with God. Now, the first 2,000 years, the world, cosmos, order of world, come to its end. And God had to send something to judgment from heaven and judge the earth in judgment and save the righteous Noah and his family. The second 2,000 years, the same thing taking place again. Cosmos, world order, even the church was polluted. The days of Noah, they mocked and made fun of him and he preached 120 years in the door of the ark. And in the second thousand years, the church would went into captivity, committed hoardedom with the world, and become nothing but a bunch of forms and creeds. And God sent judgment to the earth by sending His Son. Come to the end of its powers. Now, this is 1962. And what does the Bible say? The Bible said in the last days that the work would have to be cut short. The scriptures cannot lie. For the elected sake. For the elected sake. Or there'd be no flesh saved. Then we see we're at the end time. The seventh is the Sabbath, which is a millennium. That's the, that will take place during that time, the millennium reign. Now, but the six days is fulfilled. Man has got in his hand right now a weapon. That he can destroy himself. He can destroy the world. He can blow the world into bits in one second. He can shoot a man into orbit and swing it around over the country here and say, surrender, I'll let her loose. That's all. What would he do? Why, anybody sensible that surrender? Then what? And now, the little, it used to be the big nations dominated the big, uh, little nations and no more. They got the same thing. See? So it's become a time that we see and believe that we're at the end time. Now we could go on with this for hours, but let's just look at some of the scriptures here just a minute that looks to the seed that's been planted for the end time. If that seed of Job's spoken word, Isaiah spoke of it, every man of God, every prophet of God that he made his secrets known to, even David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the rest of them spoke of that coming seed. And when the season come, it was exactly that way. It always does. It can't fail. It's God's Word. It's eternal. It can't fail. And all of us know that Jesus was the Word. Now, let's take His Word then. 
Hebrews 1 said, God in sundry times and divers manners spoke to the prophets, but in this last days to his son Christ Jesus. Now, he was a God prophet. He was a prophet, sure. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet. But this was more than a prophet. He was God manifested in flesh. Now, this God prophet give us two or three signs that we want to look at here, great signs that we want to remember. In Matthew 24, when it was asked him, when shall these things be? What will be the coming of the end of the world? When will all this take place? He gave so many different things that would take place. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and so forth, and on and on and on. But said, learn a parable of the fig tree when it, and all the other trees. How many years Christians? Now raise your hand. Right? Thank you. I guess 100%. All right. Watch close now when we bring this end time seed sign. Jesus said, learn a parable of the fig tree. Now, when you see the fig, now learn a parable of what? The fig tree. Now, anyone knows that reads the Bible that the fig tree has always been the Jewish race of people. Joel said, what the palm worm let the caterpillar eat and so forth, that was the stump that the creeds and things eat the church down, but said, I will restore, saith the Lord. Now, the Jews was cut off, Paul tells us, and the Gentiles grafted in again into the kingdom. But notice, Jesus said, learn a parable of the fig tree. Now, that tree like Job saw, if it dies, will it live again? Sure. He said, now, when you see the fig tree and all the other trees, trees, trees of what? There's a tree of life. There's a tree of creed, nomination. There's a creed of nation. When you see the fig tree and all the other trees putting forth buds, brows, fix the leaf out, you say summer's now. Notice. Making a parable out of the nations. Now, God deals with the Gentiles for a bride, one here and one there. But he deals with the Jews as a nation, not as an individual, as a nation. He's always, that's been God's chosen nation. God chose him as a nation. Missionaries going into Jerusalem and things. When Israel is saved, she'll be a nation, the Bible says, will be born in a day. <laughs> right. So Israel will accept Christ at one, just at one, as a nation, not just as individuals. But notice now what he said. Let's take it. Watch it clear. When you see the fig tree begin to bud again and all the other trees putting forth its buds. Now, everything is having a, a revival or just had a revival. The Jews are back in their homeland as a nation, flying their own flag. Their own government. Their own money. They are a nation for the first time for about, I guess, about 1,800 years. Oh, more than that, about 2,200 years. About 2,200 years. They, Israel is a nation again. The oldest flag in the world, the six-born star of David, flies again. And for the first time for 2,200 years, and Jesus said, when she begins to put forth her bud, the time is at the door. Israel, talking to the Jews. Now watch. He said, when all the other trees begin to put forth, the Roman Catholic Church has had the greatest sweep it's ever had. The Protestant Church has had the greatest revival it's had. Billy Graham and Jack Schuler, the Pentecostals has had the greatest revival they had. Old Roberts, Tommy Hicks, and the rest of them. Great man. A revival. Notice, the powers has had a revival. The national powers. There's a revival on now. Who's going to be the greatest power? Communism. Everybody here, preachers, stand in the pulpit talking, oh, let us fear communism. Nonsense. Show me a scripture where communism will rule the world. Romanism will rule the world. Not communism. Look at King Nebuchadnezzar's vision. The word of the Lord. The head of gold. Brass. On down into the Roman feet, which was iron and never changed. The stone came while it was still in the iron and smote it. Remember, at the end it was mixed with clay. The weakness. Clay and iron together. 
This great meeting you just had up here between Khrushchev and Eisenhower. You know what Khrushchev means in his own nation, national tongue? Khrushchev means mud. Clay. You know what Eisenhower means in English? Iron. Didn't he even make it so plain to the people, Khrushchev choked off his shoe and beat the desk. They will not agree. What's going to rule? Rome will rule. A confederation of churches with Catholicism will bind it together and right there you are, the ruling power. The Bible says that. That's the seed that can't fail. Now look today. Isn't this new pope inviting all the Protestant churches in? Aren't they going? What about your Pentecostals? Same thing. The federation of churches. There you are. That seed's got to come to pass. This has got to happen. It's got to mature. It's time for it to mature. That people, what they do, organize and kept building greater buildings and bigger organizations, greater denominations. And what all happened? The same thing, exactly what the Bible said they'd do. That's what the God prophet Jesus Christ said would take place. The Jews would be restored and there would be a great revival amongst them as a nation coming together as a nation. There would be a revival amongst the Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, and so forth. A revival amongst the Pentecostals. And there you are. The nation would be striving against nation. The seed matured. Israel become a nation. After 2,200 years, what's happened? The churches all got together having a revival. All right, sir. Now another great seed was planted. He said in the last days, in Second Timothy, the third chapter... There would come amongst the church a falling away from Bible faith. That's right. Is that a seed? Is that a promise? Look at them today. Look at our churches. What are they doing? They're organizing themselves together. They're cooperating together, binding themselves together, failing. Don't believe in the Bible. Don't believe in the, in the real true word of God. You say, the Bible says this. Them things are past. There is no such a thing. Oh, there, there is no such a thing. Days of miracles just passed a long time ago. There is no such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That was for a handful of people, 12, back there, the apostle. See? What is that seed? It's maturing. It's the end time sign seed. What did Jesus say when you see these things happening? Lift up your head. Your redemption's drawing now to the church. We've seen she would fall away. All right. We find that. All right. Now we said in the last days, Joel told us, the other part of the scriptures, listen close now, that there would be a farmer and latter rain in the same season. How many Christians know that say amen? Sure. What? Now, the other day, to my surprise, when I looked, farmer and latter rain would come in the same season. Now, the word farmer in the Hebrew word, get your Hebrew life. Uh, Lexington and find out the Hebrew word for farmer means mora. Mora means teaching. There will come a teaching rain. What is it? Putting the seeds into the earth. What's that? What's going on? Well, we find out that there's been a teaching rain going on. The Baptist people, a million more in 44 was their goal. Members of the church. Billy Graham's great revivals, like great advances, look what he done. Look at Oral Roberts and the Pentecostals. There's been a teaching reign gone forth. There's been a national teaching reign. Communism sowed amongst the people. Every nation. There's been a Roman revival. You know what happens? If they give the western part or the eastern part a Berlin back, that puts communism just, I mean, the Roman Empire just exactly in the old circle it was in the time of Jesus. Certainly it does. Perfectly. There's a revival going on. What is it? A sowing. You don't hear very much of Billy Graham no more, do you? What about Oro? What about the rest of them? You know, the great revival fire is not burning. What is it? It's the end time seed sign. The words has been sown. What is it? Denomination will reap denomination. That makes them confederate themselves together. But the Word of God has been sold also. And when the Spirit of God begins to fall, the Word of God will live in the people. And that false bride that's committed adultery out there and brought herself into creeds and sold out her birthright will reap what? 
a confederation of church that's to be bound and burned like the thorns and thistles. But where the word of God's been sowed into the people's heart, it'll reap a bride for Christ as certain as I'm standing here. End time sign. What's the matter, church of God? What's the matter with us? What's the matter with you Baptists, you Presbyterians, assemblies of God, Jesus only, all the rest of you? What's the matter with us? Can't you see the seed? Don't you be careful what kind of a seed you're taking in your womb? Of your heart. Don't you take creeds. Take the word. They've been talking so much about Latterine. Not discarding you Latterine brethren. But that's not Latterine. The Latterine would have been here. The power of God would have struck that thing. It should have tripped the world. The Latterine fixing to come. What's the matter? The church is manufacturing herself something. Just like Eve tried to do. She tried to have more light to manufacture something. We've done the same thing. Trying to make something in ourselves. Keep your hand off of it. Let God do it. Take his word and believe it. Hold it in your heart. And when the rain begins to fall, life will take hold. And the word will manifest itself. I guess you think I'm crazy, but I'm not. If I am, leave me alone. I'm happy this way. So I uh, believe God's word. What's the matter with the church? Her womb, her, her open mind has received all kinds of creeds and dogmas and not the word of God. When Christ come, he found the same thing that Adam found. Same thing Jehovah found. And here are these signs in the end time appearing and the church hasn't got the answer. That's right. It's time. The farmer rains went forth. That's the reason Billy's not doing much. Remember, there was, uh, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. There was two angels went down to the Sodomites. Remember, Lot once walked with Abraham. The church once walked in fellowship with Christ, with the Word, but they sold out their birthright for denomination. Now she's selling the whole thing and organizing into one big confederation of church. That's exactly what happened to Lot. He went down there. Two angels. Old Robertson and Billy Graham, as it would be in this day, went down there and placed the gospel to him. What happened? A disgrace even come out of it. But Abraham, one stood back with him. There's one that he called God. And the sign that he performed there before him. What did he do? It proved what he was. Abraham was elected because he was, Abraham had the promise. And now look, this is Abraham's seed. The promise not only made to Abraham, but his seed, not his seed, Isaac. It failed. It proved it did. But the seed, the faith that he had, no matter what the circumstances was, how against the nature it was, how much the doctor said it wasn't so, Abraham, after he had the promise given to him when it was impossible, he married his sister about 17 years old, his half-sister. They had no children. And when she was 65 and he was 75, God appeared to him and said, you're going to have a baby by. Why, she took it. He took his word. He made ready for it. 25 years after that, nothing had happened. Now, he's 100 years old and she's 90. That didn't stop him a bit. He staggered not the promise of God through unbelief. That's the faith that's the royal seed of Abraham. That's the kind of seed that takes God's word. That's the thing that will bring the bride. That's the thing that will meet Christ. He is the word. And if the church is soaked with something else besides the word, it can't go to meeting. He hasn't got a freak body with fungus on it. He's got a perfect body. He's the perfect word. And the church will be sowed and believed in the perfect word. And the perfect word and perfect word will unite together as one flesh and one body. As a husband and wife. It's... Amen. I'm not amen in myself, but amen means so be it. I believe it anyhow. Yes, sir. The former rains went forth. The rains fixing to fall. What's it going to bring forth? You just watch. One more sign. The unwise virgin. <sighs> Jesus said... Just before the coming of the bridegroom, there would be a wise virgin with oil in her lamp and one unwise. 
And the unwise virgin would wake up one day and find out that she didn't have any oil and lamp when it became the place. Behold, the bridegroom coming. That's what the shout is now. Christ is coming. And she woke up and found out she didn't have any oil. Oral means spirit. Spirit is what brings the, the word to life. The spirit is the water that brings the word to life. Throw it out, you say, well, what about these churches? If they sold denominational seeds, it'll bring that to life. The Spirit of God will bring that to life. The Bible said the rain falls on just and unjust. Hebrews, the fourth, uh, third, sixth chapter says that the rain cometh off to dress the fruits that's of the earth, but the thorns and thistles which rejoice just as much and live just as much by the rain as they can, but by their fruits you shall know them. Exactly right. There you are. Now when they've seen that, see the fruits are to be gathered. The rain's fixing to fall. Denomination will hatch denomination, that's all. But the Word will hatch Christ. The bride, certainly, sold the word of seed. Now, when the wise virgin, have you noticed the Christian businessman's voice? I speak for them internationally. I can't pull no punches for them. This is the word. Look, what about in the, look here at the Presbyterian, Episcopalian. Hundreds of them everywhere trying to seek the Holy Ghost. They're playing up a great big thing. A precious minister friend of mine from Africa Fine man, godly man. I've asked him, don't you know what it is, brother? What's your ministry? He said, I'm supposed to bring babbling in. I, Can't you see the very time that the unwise virgin wants some oil to make her seeds to grow? Also, that's the time that Christ comes and she's left out. The great preacher Billy Graham has just said that we need a Pentecost. We need people back. Episcopalians wrote a great article, a folder that long, said we need speakers with tongues. We need divine healers in the church, having healing services, people out praying for the sick. What are they trying to do? Get oil in their lamp. Exactly. That's the end time seed sign. Amen. While she was trying to do that, the bridegroom come and the bride went in and she was locked out. Oh, what a wonderful day we're living in. Just one, th one thing more. Distress between the nations. Oh, my. Fearless sights in the heavens. You believe that so? Look, we just take a couple of them. We've got a couple more minutes to make it at 9.30. I don't want to hold the auditorium. We, the grace of these people, let us have it. Listen. How many and every one of you, you've seen the nations been shook up just recently about signs. Did you see what uh, this man in the arbor the other day? He found things up there. He never signs. So don't even know what they are. When he passed around the earth, yet they've looked and looked and looked, but they didn't see them. He thought his orbit was coming to pieces. It wasn't so. His orbit's all right. Life. Look what's just been over there. You've seen it in the radio. You saw it on television. It's been in the newspaper. Flying saucers everywhere. And the Pentagon let it out the other day about six weeks ago. It wasn't fictitious. They even showed on television how they caught these saucers with intelligence. Lights that come down, hanging over the Pentagon like that, all over Washington, D.C. And they caught it on radar and had pilots up there. And they'd come right in around them, surround around them, and move away with lightning speed. The intelligence. What is it? Jesus said there would be fearful signs. Sights in the heaven. Man's heart failing. Fear. Perplexity of time. Distress between nations. Don't you see that seed time is here now? The harvest time, the things the Bible said would come to pass, that seed that's been planted, don't you see? It's taking life and living. That's what's the matter. Now, just one thing more. Listen. Before, now listen close. Don't fail to find this now. Before the first coming of Jesus, the astronomers of India, Magi, of missionary in India and talked with Magi's about this. And they were watching. They were astronomers. They were watching the heavenly bodies. And they say God always declares himself in the heavenly body before he does in the earth, before he does anything. And they said, why well, when this, uh, uh, the three wise men went to worship this king that was to rule the earth, the baby king, that they followed a star, your scripture says. He said, but frankly, there was three stars came together and made this one star. 
And they say that the Christian astronomer that I was talking to, or Magi, he said that means that there were three races of people that this man died for. The only three races there is is Ham, Sham, and Japheth's people. And when his gospel has been preached to Ham, Sham, and Japheth's people, they come together in his gospel, then the return will be. That's all right. If he wants to believe that. Three is a number of perfection. But what do I believe that three was? What do we believe? It was a three of perfection showing that the Trinity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost was made manifest in a man. Jesus Christ, the one perfect man. All other men had failed. Everything else had died, but here come a man that couldn't die. Perfection. That even death couldn't kill him. Rose up again. Three is a number of perfection. We all know that. Three is God's number in his numerology. God is known by his numbers. Three is perfection, and seven is worship, twenty-four is worship, forty is temptation, fifty is Pentecost Jubilee. See? So forth. All these numbers, these numerals of God is perfected, is in perfection. Now, three is the number of perfection. Just before when the, listen now close, when the little baby Christ was born, three stars went together and made the one morning star that reflected the coming of a infant Christ, a perfect one. Now what's happened? We see a roar in the paper across the television, out across the nations, where five stars just fell in line with the world. What's five? A number of grace. Every time those stars come and something happens on earth, what taking place? Five stars fell in. What was it? An uh, introducing of what? Since then, just look what's taking place. Germany almost washed off the map. Some of the Magi said that the world would burst like a watermelon. There were just stressful things just prophesied by them for the last days. Look what's taking place. England the other day had a, a storm that blew away 70,000 houses one day. Disasters everywhere. California, Los Angeles like to wash into the ocean. What is it? Beginning of sorrows. Earthquakes is picked up everywhere. Why is it? Five stars come in line. Grace. God's grace. What's happened? An infant church. Hallelujah. A bride. Infancy. That the power of God is beginning to fall on her. She's taking form. A bride for this bridegroom. That three stars meant his perfection of the heavenly father of the Trinity becoming one on earth among us. God's office is becoming one office. What happened now? It's the church of the living God coming together under the word of God. And the astronomic heaven is announcing her approach. Hey, man. Might not believe that. But it's the word just the same. Yes, sir. What's happening? I'm closing. I might say this. Friends, the church is coming forth. God's going to have a church without spot or wrinkle. She's predestinated. God said so. He would have it. That makes it right. Who's a member? I don't know. I'm trusting to be myself. I'm trusting you are a member. But he's going to have a body without spot or wrinkle. And I believe that these latter-day signs and things that's happening, every one of them is feeling together to show that Christ is ready to come for this bride. As God in his word made manifest in a man, a perfect man. So is God in his word coming again and making himself manifested in a bride. Not will do like Eve did, hybrid it to something else, but the unadulterated word of God will be born into that church that shall stand like Jesus Christ did with his spirit and on him and his word. Amen. I believe it's the announcement now. The prophet said, there will come a day that won't be called day or night. And in the evening time it shall be light. All you Bible readers know that. What happens? Civilization travels from the east to the west. China is the oldest civilization we have. Civilization began in the east. It's went with the sun, traveling west. Where's it at now? The west coast. If it goes any farther, it's back east again. See what I mean? The same sun that rises in the east is the same sun that sets in the west. 
the same S-U-N, and the same S-O-N, Son of God, that come to the earth to take a bride on the eastern people. And that bride polluted herself like Eve did, like Jehovah's bride did. That same sun that shines there has shined there with the same power upon Pentecost to ripen the seed that he had planted. That same sun is shining now in the western hemisphere. The what? Ripen the seed that's been planted to bring forth a bride. The evening light of the gospel will bring forth a bride. Amen. For the Lord Jesus. There are some of the evening seeds signed. Hundreds of them. We have five minutes before closing. Are you one of those? Do you believe you're one of those seeds? Do you believe that your heart is so with the unadulterated gospel? There's nothing in the world can take the word of God out of your heart. Do you believe that? If it's not, my friend, I may never see you again on the face of this earth. But remember, the word of the Lord and the secret of the Lord is made known to his prophets. His prophet spoke of it. Here it is right here now. We're seeing it come to pass. I'm repeating what they said in a warning to you. If you do not have those seeds, and if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you maybe you belong to church, don't you take that chance, brother. Don't you listen to those things. That's a hybrid affair. The Word of God's got to live in you supremely like it did in Jesus Christ. For He's the head. His body can't be one thing, His head another. It's got to be the same Word. If your church only divide, provides for you creeds and dogmas that's not scriptural, don't you believe it? You can't be joined into a church. You're born into a body by the Word of the living God. And if you haven't got that, don't you take a chance. If you went down here to, to buy a bowl of soup and it had a spider in it, you'd sue the restaurant. Well, you wouldn't eat it for nothing because you're afraid you're going to destroy this body. Brother, don't fear what can destroy the body, but who can destroy the most soul and body in hell? If you're particular about your food, you wouldn't eat anything dirty to, to make this body sick or gaggy and then swallow any kind of a creed for your soul that's eternal when this body's got to perish? Don't you let the devil poke that stuff in your throat. You become born again of the Spirit of God, and your spirit will bear record with every word God's written here, and every promise that He's given will make itself manifested in you. The Spirit of God will come and live in you. You are Christ's body, the representation of Himself here on earth. If you haven't got that, if you can't believe for divine healing, if you're here and sick, and you believe that God will grant you divine healing, you express that word, I'm the Lord that healeth all thy diseases. Lord, I believe it. Watch what takes place. Say, Lord, I believe it. Open up every channel and here I am. Watch what takes place. The same as read to that little dying girl the other day. Thousands of more around the world. Students seen him by the, I seen in South Africa made one prayer over a bunch of people and they estimated and took seven big truckloads. By you haven't got a truck in Georgia like one of them. Almost a, six or eight wheels across here. And the next morning with the mayor of the city sitting there. Come at the wind and said, Brother Branham, come down, look here. Coming down the street, there they come down the street with seven van loads of crutches and wheelchairs and, and everything to people that never touched the one of them. Just brought the word. Told them, do you believe it? And they did. And the people that was in these things the day before, here they was walking down the street with their hands over their heart in their own native language saying, and all things are possible to only believe. He sent his word. That's all you do. Send the word. And the church receives it. He that's born of God receives God. Believes God. Do you believe him? Let us bow our heads. I'll pray for these handkerchiefs. With your heads bowed and every eye closed. I'd like to ask you a serious question. If you're not right with God, if there's something in you won't let you believe this Bible to be the inspired Word of God, you could not believe that you could live according to its rules, would you do so much as raise your hands and say, God, be merciful. I want you to pray for me, Brother Branham, that I will be that kind of a Christian. Are you here? Raise your hands. I'll... Thank you, young lady. Thank you. God bless you. All right, there's one person in the building that thinks that, two of them that thinks that. Uh, I'm not one of these persons to persuade. If the word can't move it, you can only do it as you're predestinated to believe it. 
You remember, although Jesus done so many miracles, the Pharisees couldn't believe it. They couldn't get it in their head because they wasn't to be that way. And if your heart's so hard, do you know right there that that word of God's not working itself through you? And then you won't raise your hands to God to ask for mercy. What are you going to do on the day of judgment? All right. Would there be somebody sick that'd like to be remembered? Raise your hand. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about ten of them. All right, let's bow our heads. Don't you doubt. You, my little sister back there that raised her hand, remember me. God bless you, sister. Bless your tender heart. And may the word of God take roots in your little heart tonight. You become a missionary to Christ. This man that raised his hands a little later here. Brother, your hair is gray. But remember, Abraham was 75 years old before God ever spoke to him. May God plant his roots of word in your heart tonight. When the great rain is falling, may it not bring forth just a creed. May it bring forth Christ manifested in you. Each one of you that raised your hand for healing. The Bible said the prayer of faith shall save the sick and God shall raise them up. If the seed is laying in your heart, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will water that seed right now. Something will happen. God is no respected person. If he'll save one, he'll save the other and that'll believe it. If you heal one, he'll heal the other. But you've got to believe it. If you believe it, I'm going to pray for you now. Our Heavenly Father... I'm holding my hand over some handkerchiefs laying here. Somebody's perhaps got a loved one somewhere that's sick and afflicted. Something wrong with them. Maybe a mother somewhere with a little sick baby. Maybe an old blind daddy sitting back in some little cabin out here somewhere in Georgia. Maybe a one in a hospital somewhere. I don't know us all about these things. Lord, we know this one thing. That thou art the Christ who has already purchased their healing. I'm sending your word in a way of prayer, Lord. You sent your word. The woman come to you. Said, Lord, be merciful to me, thou son of David. And you were no son of David to her. She was a Gentile. She's, you said, it's not meat for me to take the children's bread and give it to your dogs. She said, that's truth, Lord. But the dogs will take the scraps on their master's table. You said, for this saying... Your daughter will live. And we find out that when you got home, or when she got home, your word had already got there. Heal the girl. A father once for his child. He inquired what time it was. Said about the eleventh hour, the fever left him. You sent your word. Lord, I'm sending your word. When a prayer of faith. I'm sending it to that little girl there that held up her hand. I'm sending it to that man that raised his hand. May it take hold tonight for salvation. Grant it, Lord. Now you said, He that believeth, heareth my words, and believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life. Now, Lord, that's your word. You said so. According to science, they broke every rule. Science says you can't raise your hand. Gravitation holds it down, but there's a spirit in man. He can make a decision and raise his hand because he's a spirit that governs him, that breaks the rules of science. Now, God spoke, and they raised their hand towards the Creator. Heavenly Father, may your word fall in their hearts right now, into the womb of their heart. Bring forth out by them the bride of Christ. Grant it, Father, to these who raise their hand that's sick across this building here. They raise their hands because they're needy. They believe you to be a healer. Now I pray this prayer of faith. I'm sending it, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. May that faith fall in every heart just now. May the word of God be there just so emphatically to... It'll bring forth healing for every one of them. Granted, Father. Now, again, I say for these handkerchiefs that's laying here. In the Bible, it said they took from the body of Paul handkerchiefs and aprons and unclean spirits went out of the people. Diseases departed. Now, we're not St. Paul. But it wasn't him that did it. Because in him was the word. You're still the same word. Now, Father... One time Israel was cut off from the promised land. It was your bride. You had her on the road to the promised land. You was making a way far. The enemy got in the way. You looked down through that pillar of fire with angry eyes. 
The sea got scared. It moved back. Israel went on. Now God, not looking through the pillar of fire, but look through the blood of your own son who died for this purpose. And I send your word. May the devil be scared. May he get away. May these people come to that promise of God like Israel did. Without any failure, may they come to that great promise. Above all things, I would that you prosper in health. Grant it, Lord. May this do the work while we stand it, saying that your word will not return to you, void. It accomplish that which was purpose for. And I pray this prayer of faith for these people in the name of Jesus Christ. And while we have our heads bowed, how many of you now will accept what's been said and believe that the word of God has come to you and you're accepting it? Everyone that raise your hand, no matter what it was for, you'll raise your hand and say, I believe I accept it right now. I believe I have what I asked for. God bless you. That's wonderful. That's fine. God bless you. I hope that the Word of God takes its root in you. Now, you've got to, while you have your head bowed, you've got a pastor here, a lovely brother, to come here and make a, a quotation like you did a few moments ago. An evangelist mustn't have all to do in the meeting. You must know you're a pastor, this godly man. I'm so glad to get to this people who raise their hands for these things and give to them this lovely pastor. Let him lead you now to the deeper experiences of God for your healing and for your salvation. God bless you.